Hey guys, Jake here coming at you with another math lesson today. Today what we're going to be going over is when you use the product rule versus the chain rule. You know, basically looking at a function that you know you need to take the derivative of, how you come to the decision of which method you need to use to take the derivative of that function. Like I said, we're specifically going to be going over the product rule versus the chain rule. And the reason why I just want to go over these two methods is, you know, between product rule, chain rule, and quotient rule, those three methods account for a lot of the derivatives that you would need to know how to find. Those are three very useful methods for finding derivatives. But quotient rule is oftentimes a lot more uh, easily determined just because it's only usable when you have two functions that are in a fraction with each other. If you're not given something that has an obvious quotient or a fraction, um, you know, it's pretty easy to eliminate that one pretty quickly. But product rule versus chain rule is a little bit harder decision to make. So I want to go over some examples of how to choose between the two rules. And then throughout the rest of the week, I'm going to be posting a few more videos about actually applying these rules to find derivatives. So be sure to subscribe and check back throughout the rest of the week um, to, you know, kind of build on this topic of product rule versus chain rule. So let's go through these eight examples and just determine if we wanted to find the derivative of these eight functions, what we would use to do it. So let's start with this first one up here, sine squared of 4x squared plus 2. Really when you're trying to decide between product rule or chain rule, the first thing, product rule is a little bit easier to recognize because it's going to be used when you have the product of two functions or two functions being multiplied together. If you don't have any multiplication going on in your function, product rule is not really going to work. So if we look at this function here, we basically have, you know, this 4x squared plus 2 being plugged into sine squared of something, or in this case, of that 4x squared plus 2. But there's not really any products going on here. There is the multiplication of 4x squared, um, but that's not really, you know, like a, a whole function being multiplied by another function. You don't want to use product rule if you just have a constant times something. That's a much easier thing to deal with. We only want to do it when you have, you know, some function of your variable, or x in this case, times some other more complex function of x. If you just have a constant times something, you don't need to use product rule there. So there's really nothing, no products, no multiplication to indicate that the product rule is a good choice for this first one. So the next thing to think about would be chain rule. Can we apply the chain rule here? Well, chain rule is what you want to apply whenever you're dealing with a composite function, or in other words, some function of x being plugged into some other function. So if we look at this, first of all, what I would recommend, whenever you have some trig function squared like this, sine squared of a bunch of stuff, it makes a lot more sense to think of this as sine of 4x squared plus 2 all squared. Right? These two things mean the same thing. Whenever you see sine squared of something, that's the same as saying sine of that thing all squared. Same thing with cosine squared or tan squared, um, or really to any power. Writing this is just a notational thing, but these two things mean the same thing. So if we look at this function here, you can see that if we kind of work our way from you know inside to outside, what I mean is within, within this smallest set of parentheses and kind of working our way out from there, we kind of have this inner function here being plugged into sine of x or sine of something, which is all then being squared. So we kind of have three functions all being plugged into each other. So that kind of composite function build that we have here tells us that this is a good problem to apply chain rule to if we wanted to find the derivative of this function. And this is a little bit more complex than just simply applying the chain rule because we have these three functions as we work from in to out. So we have 4x squared plus 2 being our innermost function, and then we have one level out from there, we're taking sine of that 4x squared plus 2, and then one more level out from there, we're squaring that sine of 4x squared plus 2. So this is a little more complex situation than just simply using chain rule, but chain rule is certainly what we would want to apply here. And in fact, one of the videos I'm going to do later in the week is how to deal with this situation where we want to take the chain rule of having three or more functions all being plugged into each other. 
In fact, throughout the rest of this week, I'm going to be talking about chain rule and product rule in regards to kind of how it's explained in this book that I found called The Calculus Lifesaver. You can see it here. This is, I, I got the ebook version of it. It's a really great book. It really does explain a lot of different topics in calculus, derivative and integral calculus, as well as sequences and series in a really kind of intuitive and easy to understand way, which is really great for someone trying to learn calculus. You can get it for less than $20 on Amazon as of the time of recording this video. There's a link in the description if you want to check out that book. You can get the ebook version, paperback, you can get hardback too. It's a little bit more than $20, but either way, it's a very affordable book and it really does explain a lot of calculus topics in a really easy to understand way. So throughout the rest of the week, I'm going to be talking about chain rule and product rule and kind of relating them to how they're explained in this book, which is a really good you know, way to think about these these derivative rules. So like I said, this first example, the best way would be to apply chain rule to find that derivative. So let's go on to the second one here. You can see we have 3x cubed plus 2x squared minus 7x, all being multiplied by x to the fifth minus 9x to the fourth plus 16x squared plus seven. So you can see pretty clearly here in this example, we have these two things, these two more complex functions in parentheses being multiplied together. So like I said, two functions and you're taking the product of them or you're multiplying them together is exactly the case where you would want to use product rule, right? Because we have one function here being multiplied by our second function here. So if we call this one of our functions and then we call this our other function, we can then apply the product rule there. We don't really have a composite function here because it's more simply described as the product of these two more complex functions. So then example three down here, we have 16 e to the sine x. So again, like I said with the first example, taking a constant multiplied by something doesn't necessarily mean that you want to use the product rule. It's usually more simple to deal with that. So we do not want to say call one function 16 and one function e to the sine x and take the derivative using product rule because the product of a constant times something else doesn't really warrant the use of that rule. Instead, what we want to think about is we have sine of x kind of trapped in our exponent. So we can kind of think of this as our inner function. And then as we work our way out, the 16 e to the sine x or 16 e to the x would be our outside function. So we're basically plugging sine of x into 16 e to the x. So as a result, we have a composite function because we have the sine x being plugged into another function. And therefore we can use chain rule to do that. Again, I'll be coming out with more videos throughout the week to explain how to actually do this. Um, but for now, that is a pretty good explanation of why we would want to move forward with the chain rule in this example. So let's go on to this next one down here. We have natural log of natural log of x plus 2x. So again, we don't really have any products or multiplication going on in this function, right? This is not saying natural log times natural log of x plus 2x natural log of x is a function which natural log of x plus 2x is being plugged into. So again, we have this natural log of x plus 2x being plugged into the other function, which is the natural log of x. So if we take natural log of x plus 2x and plug that into natural log of x, we would end up with this entire composite function. So that's a pretty good indicator that chain rule would be the way to go with this example. Going on to the fifth one here, we have something that looks very similar, but it is a bit different. Here we have natural log of x times natural log of x plus 2x. So now in this case, we do have a product, right? We have natural log of x as one function being multiplied by natural log of x plus 2x as our other function. So in this case, we can apply the product rule because we have the multiplication of these two functions here, right? So if we treat this natural log of x as one of our functions being multiplied by the natural log of x plus 2x, now we have a product of these two functions. We can apply the product rule. Now moving on to number six down here, we have 12 times e to the x times sine x. So again, we have multiplication of these two functions here. We have 12 e to the x being one function and then sine of x being our other function. So again, we have this product or this multiplication of these two more complex functions. We can go ahead and move forward with the product rule in this case, where 12e to the x is one function, sine of x is our other function. Really, when you're dealing with constants with the product rule or chain rule, um, especially with the product rule though, since we just have 12 times e to the x times sine of x, we could pretty much put this constant 12 
along with either our e to the x function or our sine x function and move forward with our product rule there. Since it's naturally written with our e to the x, it's fine to just leave it with that. It really doesn't matter which of these two functions, e to the x or sine of x, we put the constant 12 with because it's a constant. So since we have that, we can just go with 12e e to the x and sine of x as our two functions and go with the product rule. Now onto the seventh one here, we have 16x squared plus 7x minus 1, all in parentheses being multiplied by cosine x. So again, we have a product. We have multiplication of two more complex functions. That's really the key here. That's really all we're looking for as we go through all these. If we have multiplication of two entire functions being multiplied together, that's a pretty good hint that you want to use the product rule. So here we have this complex function here being multiplied by cosine of x. We can treat cosine of x as one function, 16x squared plus 7x minus 1 as one function, and go forward with the product rule from there. Now this last example here is a little bit tougher, um, but we have 4 sine squared of x plus 3 sine of x minus 4. In this function, we don't really have uh, a product or multiplication. I mean, we do obviously have constants being multiplied by sine of x or sine squared of x, but we don't really have two entire functions being multiplied together. So if you kind of use that fact to eliminate the, the fact that we would think about using the product rule and kind of move forward with the chain rule, the next obvious question is, you know, kind of thinking about your inner function as opposed to what that inner function is being plugged into to find your outer function. And that's not super obvious because we kind of have this sine squared here, this sine here. It's a little bit hard to tell if you're trying to write this as a composite function, what's being plugged into what. But when you have something like this, where you kind of have a trig function, which is like built into uh, a quadratic function because we have this squared piece and we just have the trig function by itself and then we have a constant. Generally, making that trig function be your kind of inner function will help get you a little bit closer, right? Because if we think about this, remember, sine squared of x is the same as sine of x all squared, just like what we had up here. So if you think about that, if we say our inner function is sine of x, now let's imagine just saying u equals sine of x. And what we're gonna do is go back to this whole function and we're gonna replace sine of x wherever we see a sine of x with u. So doing that, this term here is gonna change from sine squared x, which is again, the same as sine of x all squared. Therefore, sine squared of x, in this case, since we're gonna say sine of x is the same as u, would be the same as u squared, right? So if we replace this with u squared, and then we replace this sign with u, now we have 4u squared plus 3u minus 4. And this is a technique that was discussed in that the book I was just talking about, The Calculus Lifesaver. Again, definitely a good read. I'll put the link in the description so you can check that out. But this really does illustrate quite simply how to use chain rule because we've basically determined that this is going to be our inner function. If we designate this whole inner function as u, we can just take this, replace this inner function in our original function with just the single variable u. And now all we have here is a quadratic function, which is 4u squared plus 3u minus 4. If we were trying to find the derivative of a quadratic function, that's really quite simple. You could do that using the power rule much more simply than what we started with. And like I said, I'll show you how to actually do that in the next couple of videos this week. But that is a good demonstration of how to know that you can use the chain rule by simply deciding what your inner function will be and kind of replacing that with a single variable throughout your whole function. And if you do that, are you left with something that's a lot easier to deal with? And in this case, we are, right? This quadratic is much easier to deal with. So we want to go ahead and go forward with the chain rule in this last one. I'll put a link to my next video where I talk about how to actually apply the product rule versus chain rule as soon as that comes out. But in the meantime, if you found this helpful, please give the video a like, subscribe to the channel. It's a great way to support the channel so I can keep making more videos like this. Thanks and see you next time.